It's a big pleasure today to welcome uh, Professor John Usher, uh, who will be giving us a lecture today entitled Lethbridge Regional Food Hub, Feasibility Study Final Report. Dr. John Usher is a professor of organization theory at the Dillon School of Business and is a Prentice Institute research affiliate. He is a former president of the University of Lethbridge Faculty Association Alpha. He was uh, dean of the Faculty of Management from July 2002 until February 2004. Dr. Usher came to, uh, to Alberta from St. John's, New Finland, where he was in the Faculty of Business Administration at Memorial University from 1994 until 2002, most recently as Associate Dean of Graduate Programs and research. Dr. Usher served as a faculty member at the University of Alberta from 1988 until 1994 and was an academic coach and course developer with Athabasca University's Distance EMBA program from 1994 until 2003. Dr. Usher has extensive expertise in the business world as a strategic planning specialist, production supervisor, senior factory accountant and quality control supervisor gained at General Motors of Canada over a 10-year period. Please join me in welcoming Dr. John Asher. today is a follow-up from one that I gave here about two years ago when this project was first getting going and um, the, uh, the kind of the subhead was if we build it will they come um, so we're this is not a, an optimistic <laughs> final report um, so we should get that up there first of all uh, we won't be building it so they won't be coming but uh, I thought that rather than just kind of put this away in the file drawer, that uh, at least we should talk about why that was the decision that the, the group came to and uh, what we think should happen next, even if it isn't a food hub. So that's so what we're going to talk about. So first of all, what is a food hub? Let's make sure everybody's on the same page there. Uh, look at some fun facts about local agriculture. Uh, the 2011 Census of Agriculture for Alberta, published in 2014, is still, I think, the most current statistics on this region. So we're going to kind of build from that. Um, looking at the, what the project was, who all the fine people are that were on the team, um, scale is going to be a big issue. Yes. Um, and uh, this is uh, that we've talked to in the USDA a fair number of times, has a catchphrase which is no margin, no mission. So there's a lot of people that get involved in the alternative uh, movement, but can't really make the numbers work, and so things kind of get into trouble. I'm going to look at the interviews that we took, um, discuss the, the principle of additionality how that plays into the feasibility of a food hub. Uh, we'll look at business to business and business to institutions prospects. And I want to sort of do a little bit of a step aside and you know, talk about the future of food and all the other various um, enterprises coming and going with respect to food. And then finally end up with what we think is perhaps a better way to connect supply and demand which is uh, more or less a, uh, a speed dating setup. All right, so what is a food hub anyway? Um, what this is, is um, as the diagram implies, a hub which works with local producers to bring products to buyers. And so the, the oversight is that there's, there's lots of new and, and good information about how supply chain management works. Uh, usually it drives the global economy. Uh, we want to see if it can drive small local farmers. So a um, good uh, example of this is Red Tomato. We'll look at a, a short video 
the theory. Um, try to bring that theory home. And here's home. So um, we figured that the regional limits for, or realistic limits for the regional hub would be centered around Lethbridge. So we could pull in Pincher Creek, Ranch Land, Willow Creek, County of Lethbridge, Cardston, Warner, and Tabor. If we get up into Vulcan, we're getting pretty close to Calgary, and we didn't really think of Calgary as part of this. Um, and once we start to move further east, we pull up into uh, Cyprus, and Cyprus is where Red Hat Co-op is, which is a, a big operation in its own right. So keeping it kind of close, we get a total population of about 140,000. Um, that from the census has 3,868 farms, 6.1 million acres. Uh, 75 of those farms grow vegetables and that excludes the greenhouses. But the greenhouses in this region aren't that many. Uh, 765,000 square feet sounds like a lot, but you compare it to Medicine Hat and you've got 4,800,000 square feet. So the Red Hat Co-op in Red Cliff is really going concern there. And they have vegetables, um, as you have seen, in the local grocery stores, and they're planning on just going right across BC as well. Some of the other fun facts, irrigation, um, quite a few of the farms, a lot of commercial fertilizer being used, herbicides, insecticides, fungicides. The number of all organic vegetable farms out of that 3,868 is about 14. So, not a, not a lot of activity out there. Okay, further to this, um, people are always saying, you know, are there more cows than people? There sure are. Uh, because for every human in this region, there are 19 chickens, 81 dozen eggs, eight cattle, almost three pigs. Don't even think about that. Six and a half acres of wheat, but only 225 square feet of agricultural space devoted to vegetables. Okay, big business, big ag. Total farm receipts in this region, two and a half billion dollars. Okay, so there's a lot of a lot of money being made in big agriculture locally. All right. So what this project attempted to do is say, all right, we see, you know, we've got the the red tomato kind of plan. Can this work here? And so we wanted to kind of look at it. And uh, assuming that there were positive findings from the feasibility study, put together a business plan, go and raise some capital, start running. So it was, uh, was optimistic about who's on the team. So that includes me. It also includes Jan Warren, who is here. Jan, give us a wave. And uh, she's a new venture coach in the Department of Local and Domestic Market Expansion at Alberta Ag and Forestry. And so she has a uh, her fingers into all the stuff around market innovation and uh, negotiating food safety regulations and solving distribution problems and, and generally showing people how to be financially viable as well. So it's a very hands-on job that she does and a very nice addition to the team. Uh, team member Deb Jarvie is an instructor in the accounting area and her expertise is in supply chain management, which we sort of saw as a core issue in, in making one of these work. Um, I had a graduate student, Kamal Jaffrey, and uh, an undergraduate student, Evan Link, and they did a lot of the um, visiting farms, interviewing people, gathering data. Uh, so that was very, very helpful. And that, of course, is why the, the project got funded, because it was all about student salaries and, and not about uh, anything else. Okay, so how did it work? How long did it take? So we ran the study from January of 2016 to April 2017. Uh, did a lot of uh, research in terms of what uh, this is a huge the food hub thing is, is huge particularly in the US and 
uh, increasingly in Canada, but very spotty in terms of success. So that was something that we wanted to try to understand. Uh, we were going out to talk to local producers, buyers, um, some surveys, some interviews, some meetings. Um, basically, let's, let's figure out what's going on locally. All right, um, now, in, in order to discover whether this thing was go or no go, uh, we wanted to say, well, what is it that we're actually talking about? It's not the food hub isn't just a, a monolithic kind of concept. There are different kinds of food hubs. And so mainly we wanted to see if, in fact, we wanted to set up a, a farm to business, what would be called a wholesale food hub, or a farm to consumer, which is a direct to consumer food hub. And, and there are various in between, but the uh, USD information gives us those two models. Now, um, I apologize for the numbers. They probably are not really legible, but this is just to prove that we actually did look at numbers. Um, so, so the wholesale food hub, um, mostly focused on retailers and institutional buyers. And the product offerings aren't just seasonal vegetables because there's an intent to try to stretch um, sales uh, away from pure seasonality. Uh, doesn't rely on volunteer labor, but instead has paid staff. And uh, kind of the, the, there's a break even, a growth and a viability stage to this kind of model uh, to achieve viability. It's $2.4 million in revenue a year. So it's a, it's a big operation. <coughs> the, if we want to go little, we can do the direct-to-consumer food hub. Uh, this one is mostly about fresh produce. Um, sometimes we'll shut down during the winter. Um, distribution is made directly to end consumers, pickup locations, um, what's often called a, a CSA, Community Supported Agriculture. That's what that is about, and we have several examples of that locally that, um, that work. Uh, operated by a mix of staff and volunteer labor. So uh, in some cases, it's entirely volunteer labor. Okay, but even, even for that, um, and there's not a whole lot of facility costs that gets rolled in, uh, or even equipment cost. It's really, a, this is about as bare bones as you can get it and still have it be viable. But that still means that you need to turn about $566,000 a year uh, in revenue. So how does that look for us? Well, about this time, the USDA put out a book called Running a Food Hub, Assessing Financial Viability. And we read it, and we said, oh, this is not good. Um, so we made a phone call to, to James Barm at the USDA in, in DC. And he was one of the major art, uh, authors of this, and said, okay, well, so what is exactly the minimum economic scale that we can run at? And he said that if you've got a largely urban mix, which we don't, um, that would be about 1.2 million for the wholesale model and 500,000 for the direct-to-consumer model. So recalling now that we have about 150,000 people in our region, we're a little short. Um, so we, uh, we said, well, I guess we could have stopped right there and uh, given all the money back. But because it was going to go to students anyway, we thought, well, let's, let's carry on. Um, I mean, the um, people that are, you know, understand network theory and, and how these things are supposed to work are, are kind of thinking, well, what, why did you think that Lethbridge was a hub anyway, a hub of what? Um, so in, in bigger terms, you know, we could have said, well, yeah, we could be um, supplying Calgary, clearly, there's enough people there, but when we, we wouldn't be supplying, we wouldn't have our hub in Lethbridge, we'd have it somewhere closer to Calgary. Um, but we wanted to at least give the local producers an idea of what was going on, and so we went ahead with the interviews. Um, we put together uh, a list of 64 local producers based on uh, people that were at farmers markets, uh, supplier relationship with local retailers and restaurants, and people that had just kind of stuck their hand up at, at uh, meetings and said, you know, we'd like to talk to you about this. Out of that number, uh, and of course, as the, 
as the, uh, the year wore on, we found that all these people had other stuff to do, like run their farms. Uh, so we ended up with, uh, with 13 uh, interviews, 20% response rate. That's still a lot better than we get with a lot of other things. Um, we had one large institutional buyer and uh, an independent retailer of local food and one local entrepreneur whose existing business fit the description of a food hub because we wanted to see what the kind of the competition, if you will, was like. Okay, I'm just going to kind of run through some of the results from those. So the list of products is there. Um, quite a wide selection of things. Um, market outlets, the farmers markets, uh, the ones here and uh, other places are in the, around the region. Uh, the Urban Grocer, Plum Restaurant, uh, CSA baskets, university, college, golf course, gas stations, processors, street corners, uh, the Agriplex in, in Tabor, grocery stores, um, Gallimax, Lush Lane, Umami, Mocha Cabana, Humble, Olive, and LA International. Does anybody know where LA International is going? It's not so. No, they, they closed. Oh, they closed. They closed. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You're pretty sad about that, Julia. Yeah. Mixed feelings, actually. <laughs> right. Um, okay. So, yeah, kind of uh, spread around a lot. And, uh, of course, a number that are using various places. So, uh, uh, Broxburn, of course, goes to the farmer's market, but they also sell into Cisco, which ends up at Mocha Cabana, and those kinds of strange relationships where the the local food is going up to Calgary to be warehoused and then brought back to Lethbridge to be eaten. I guess that's efficient in some way. Okay, um, increasing amounts of online presence. So 57% now of, of the people we interviewed had some kind of an online presence. Uh, it might be a, a full kind of um, ordering software. A lot of this stuff has, the price has dramatically dropped and uh, supported by, by co-ops. Um, some of the food hubs that were very good at this end of things have decided that they uh, are much happier supplying tech than they are supplying food. And so they've, they've kind of gotten out of the food market entirely and now they're just online and, and they'll sell you food or tech just to run your food hub. Okay, we have the, uh, we asked people why would uh, somebody buy your products as opposed to similar products. M nearly half said quality, um, heritage seeds and breeds. Uh, most interesting was the organic question. So we really only talked to one person who was certified organic. Uh, but a lot of people said that they were kind of organic-like. So most argued that they believed their methods, no pesticides, herbicides, GMOs, only organic fertilizer and humane treatment of animals were still consistent with the goals of certification. But that scale was again a problem because it costs money to be certified and you know, if you can sort of communicate that you are organic friendly, then you can still sell things. Now of course for the people that have put the money in to be actually certified, that is a not a great way to, for things to operate. Generally, challenges were seen as uh, consumer awareness, marketing, promotion, uh, distribution, storage. Pricing is uh, continues to be an issue, particularly if you are. Um, uh, it, it's a scale again, right? The more stuff you make, the, the less you, the less money you have to get for it. Spread, spread fixed costs. Um, Institutional demand is still very difficult to get. We'll talk about that a bit later. Uh, and seasonality uh, still continues to be a problem. Is there, you know, lots of people would say, you know, once the farmer's market closes, then we really don't know what to do with stuff. Uh, we're either going to only grow things that we can put in the, in the root cellar, or we're going to expand outside of the region and pull in food from other places. Okay, so we had, uh, after this, sort of sat down and said, so you know, what's a wannabe food I've got to do? Uh, is the region too small? Um, or are they just not engaged? You know, so 
there aren't going to be more than 150,000 people here anytime soon, certainly not 500,000. And even if they're fully engaged, well, that still doesn't even get us to the minimum threshold, uh, according to the, the folks who, who study this stuff. Um, questions around should they be producer-led or consumer-led? So what is a food hub? Food hubs are kind of both. A lot of them are producer co-ops. A bunch of farmers get together and decide that they're going to basically do what Red Tomato does. Um, and that seems to be the, the more favored model. Are they for-profit or are they not for-profit? So the, if it's producer-run, it's very often for-profit because that's the whole point. Um, but as we'll see, there are hang-ups with, uh, with being for-profit. Um, people expect you to kind of do it yourself, not just have money shoveled back. Um, do we want to compete uh, or do we want to collaborate? Is this about a community of people that believe that local food is an important issue and they're, we want to try to have everybody on board? Or do we want to go out there and say we're the best food hub there is and we're going to crunch everybody in our path? Well, no, that's so. Um, is it a cooperative? So if it's a uh, who gets any surplus? Is the surplus divided among the people that are running the co-op? Or, well, that would be a co-op. Or is it a food hub which has essentially been capitalized by somebody else and that's where some of that surplus is going? Uh, all kinds of issues around what is the product line going to be? Is it all just fresh vegetables? Or do we try to get something that will stretch the season? How do you price? Um, questions around whether it's organic food, whether it's uh, local food, whether it's ethical sourced food. Um, I guess we, we didn't really think about GMOs, although that was a fascinating movie last night that we, we saw. Um, what's the timing of this kind of thing? Is it, do you kind of have to go big or go home? Or can you do a little bit each year and get bigger and bigger and, and still survive? Um, there, are, there is some infrastructure that's usually needed, some storage, some uh, transportation, so some trucks. Where do they come from? Do you go out and buy them? Do you kind of maybe find somebody that's got trucks and got storage and, and just sort of tag along with them? And then the issue of do you run entirely on volunteers or do you, because what this is, is supposed to be, if you, if you have the model where you're going to deal with institutional buyers, they, they're looking to have somebody call like a one, one phone call message rather than trying to chase all this stuff down and you know you really only get that through through paid staff okay I mentioned additionality so the values prospect of, of proposition of a regional food hub um, if it thinks about additionality is that its activities bring about an additional income for producers and supply for producers purchasers not take away or compete with existing markets and sources. So it's, you know, that food hub is intended to become a part of the local food framework, not um, just something that gets dropped in and, and uh, another, another middleman that takes, takes their piece. Because um, this is a, a, an industry where the margins are very small. So additionality. Some good looking guys there. Um, this is, this, these are the kinds of things that we want to think about. You know, would a food hub compete with farmers markets as an outlet for local farmers? Um, that's, that's a problem. Um, you talk to people at the farmers market and, and say, well, what about a food hub? And they say, well, you know, we're, we're kind of okay with what we've got now. We, you know, we grow a certain amount. It's uh, the family is the, you know, the people that run the thing. Uh, if we want it to be any bigger, we'd have, we'd have to start hiring employees, and that's a whole different ball game. Um, and we like the face-to-face -face people. Um, the, the idea that you know, customers are coming and talking to us, and, and uh, so to just give it to a food hub cuts all that out of it. Um, the increase in, in the number of CSAs that have been started up is also um, kind of a nice piece because it does allow a little bit of seasonal stretch after the farmer's markets are not available. And as I mentioned before, there's a lot of online ordering systems now that, that really help people to, to make that stuff happen. 
some of the local producers we talked to said they had no interest in either being uh, supported to reach greater scale or in being educated about local food marketing or food safety that uh, Alberta Ag and Forestry already do a great job in both of those tasks. If they want to get bigger, that's where they go. If they need information about food safety, that's where they go. That's, that's a lot different than the U.S. So one of the, the pieces of the Food Hub in the U.S. is that they provide this kind of information to farmers. Um, and then finally, we've got Gallimax, who are kind of a local food hub already operating and doing a great job and so what do we what do we want to do with that they they relate to quite a few local farmers they're taking the produce up to calgary edmonton um, high-end restaurants you know getting some good money for for people that are that are local farmers so unless we can do better than that why would we want to get in there and just kind of divide that up somehow if we even could because uh, Really, it's pretty, pretty tough. So, um, here are some of the, the the lessons that we learned when we started to look around, because there are a lot of kind of struggling food hubs out there, unfortunately. And so, distribution. Um, while we we're able to continue to use an already established distribution agent, it was tough to make his roots and timelines match the needs of our producers and their harvesting timelines. Um, Timely distribution service, we need to operate our own truck and routes, and to do so requires capital outlay we're unable to raise this year. So being able to kind of piggyback on somebody who has a truck and has some sort of a route, whether it's, I don't think they were using the mail route, but it was, you know, kind of a, a distribution route that wasn't related to food, but was at least a truck going out into uh, a bunch of small communities, but inevitably that, that runs you into problems. Um, price. So small farmers face huge challenges trying to compete with the established supply chain. Um, and this is large industrial, including organic. So it's not just if you're gonna say, well, you know, we're dealing with organic food. Well, there's a sort of a lot of organic food in the big grocery stores now, and it's not coming from here. It's coming from California, New Mexico, and everywhere else. So the volumes required to allow farms to sell at wholesale prices requires larger farms. And that requires paying salaries. And so of all of the members that this particular food hub was handling, there were only two that were really running at wholesale volumes. And so that, um, that will also trickle down into another piece that we'll talk about in a minute. This um, startup was also trying to become not just a food hub, but kind of a labor hub so that farmers could draw on um, a supply of workers for different needs on the farm. And um, that was a bit of a problem because they were a for-profit co-op and they couldn't, be, couldn't apply for any of the programs that the government has around subsidies for local farm management. So they ended up having to be switched from a for-profit to a not-for-profit just so that they could get some, some subsidized help for that particular problem. Right. Um, now, one of the things that, that is at the core of this concept is that somebody is trying to coordinate all this stuff in the same way that the, the big guys in the big offices are doing. <coughs> so the cost of service, primarily a coordinator's salary, outweighed the small fee that was being charged for the service. So here's an additional piece that's being pulled out of the supply chain. Uh, and that's okay if you've got a lot of volume, but for most of the farms, again, there wasn't really enough. The 5% of what was actually flowing wasn't enough to pay a coordinator's salary. So the coordinator went from being paid to being a volunteer. And that's got to hurt. And that's got to, you know, you got to worry about how long people are going to do that sort of thing. Yes. All right, so good intentions aren't enough. So here's a, here's a company um, in Nashville. And I'm sorry, Louisville. Uh, Louisville had 500 re reoccurring weekly customers and uh, never turned a profit, to her knowledge, the chairperson said. Uh, if you look at 
across the bottom of this, you can see a whole lot of capital flowing in. Uh, you've got what you would think would be a fairly good size uh, set of customers. Uh, this is the kind of operation where basically the, the food hub is operating to just kind of pull the food together and then take it to, uh, it's more of a CSA kind of thing. So here's a few distribution points, come and get it. Uh, make your orders online, we'll put it in a box for you and you can come and pick it up. So you look at this and say, well, I, all this money flowing in, um, quite a few, uh, let's see, so we, yeah, food from family farms within a 150-mile radius of Louisville. And, So they uh, had 70 farmers in this network. And you, you kind of look at this and you go, okay, so we've got a lot of capital, we've got a lot of customers, we've got a lot of farmers, and it still can't work. So um, it's, it's not the kind of thing that's very inspiring to go out and, and uh, start something of your own. Um, part of... Um, what we looked at in going through is to say, okay, so there's, there are again these two models, right? One is the, uh, the food goes to the consumers, the other is that you're trying to connect farmers with institutional buyers. So what are usually called the eds and meds, which is the educational institutions and the medical, so the hospital, the college, the university, that kind of thing. Um, so there are some, some local niche producers that get some traction with restaurants and, and institutional buyers, but they're it's like mustard and jerky. It's, it's very specialized kind of thing. Um, larger product producers like Roxburn sell into Cisco and then get into local restaurants. But I did uh, look at all of the restaurants in, in uh, Lethbridge and Medicine Hat and Red Deer. And uh, yeah, we have basically 80 franchised restaurants and 47 independents. So if you think about how if those uh, franchised restaurants are going to be with respect to the cost of food, it's probably not very. So there are certainly some places out there that manage to do this. Um, as I mentioned, uh, Mocha Cabana, now the, um, Angel at Mocha Cabana used to work for Cisco, so she's got to, she knows how to get it done. Um, but uh, that may be part of the problem. Now, uh, Red Deer is actually worse than we are, 82 franchised over 41. Independence Medicine had 50 franchise to 27 independents. And this is in town, right? So you, uh, I also looked at Standoff, Barron's, Carston, Carmen, pretty much everything that, that uh, was in our region that wasn't in Lethbridge, which is about 42,000 people. And there uh, we've got a much better ratio, um, but still, uh, so that uh, that ratio is 0.59. Uh, the other smaller towns, 3.38. So there's uh, 71 independents and 21 franchised. So, but that doesn't help when you're trying to do a, a hub that everything is going on outside. Um, the a lot of the relatively successful food houses, although when you dig down into them, they're not as successful as they appear. Are, fo are, are in kind of university towns. So this was another thing that made us think, oh, that sounds like us. Um, but mostly this stuff has to be student driven. Uh, because when you look at, when you talk to people in Aramark, Sodexco, uh, you know, Chartwells is the new, new folks in town, it's about 4% of their budget that they're allowed to substitute for. And everything else has to be uh, has to be um, you know ordered from the Cisco menu. Uh, so there's not a lot of room unless students really go ballistic and and say you know they're they're not going to take the classes unless they get better food. And frankly, the students here don't care, or a lot of them don't care. Um, so that that's a that's not going to happen anytime soon either. That the University of Lethbridge decides that they they want to support a food. Um, 
So, for example, the Intervale Food Hub has been working with Sodexo at the University of Vermont with 10,000 students for over 10 years to what they call effectively meet their demands without compromising our commitment to our producers, the high quality of our products, and our bottom line. So uh, their, their conclusion is that students need to be pushed out of their comfort zones and they need to start demanding and eating higher quality, healthier, and more diverse. Facial Fresh Direct still looks good. Um, so this is kind of a, um, here's, you can put in your delivery times and tell you when the stuff shows up. And all of the, this is a, an order, order online and, um, and then it gets brought to a, to a place near you. Now, of course, this is in New York City, so it's, it's a little bit better when it comes to scale. Um, okay, Farmigo, now this is the one that, uh, that I mentioned has basically bailed on its uh, online farmer's market. So now they're going to, uh, they realized that um, so yeah, we realized that uh, we wanted to do everything, but it turned out they were really good at software and not very good at logistics, and so now that's what they're doing. So all they're going to do now is, uh, so they've closed down uh, the other piece, and they're just going to do technology. Um, meanwhile, back at the ranch, of course, you may have seen the uh, skip the dishes is now pretty much out there everywhere you go. And, uh, yeah, we, we find increasingly entertaining when we go into something like the Taj or whatever, and, and we're the only people there, except the people that keep coming in with little bags and taking food away to other people. Uh, some of the stats on that say that there's going to be a 15% or 15-fold increase in that kind of consumption relative to the growth of restaurants. So it's one of those things where you know, if you want any of this stuff, that's how you can get it. Just skip the dishes. Um, uh, Save on Foods and Superstore sure if Safeway's into this yet. Also have their own website right, where you can order food and it gets, gets brought to you or you can go there and just pick it up, drive up in front of the store and they'll bring it out to you. Um, this one, yeah, okay, so we're gonna get it. So this is kind of a food hub as a theme park. So. Um, this is just south of um, Calgary around Spruce Meadows. So you can go there and uh, have all this stuff going on. Now it was intended to be, and it is, so there are winter hours, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. But the idea of it was going to be that it would be kind of a year-round farmer's market. Now it's a different kind of farmer's market because most of the food that, that you can get there is grown there. So they have, um, greenhouses, and, but they also have cool kitchens and uh, lots of things to do, uh, things to, you know, for your kids to enjoy. So it'll be interesting to see how that, how that turns out. So, where do we go from here? What we're suggesting is what could be called the facilitating food hub. And so when I was looking at all of the, uh, the failed food hub case study, we came upon this statement from the Vermont Agency of Agriculture. It says, so initially many of the food hubs believed that Vermont needed more aggregation and distribution infrastructure to connect smaller producers with institutional and wholesale markets. However, most learned that their areas simply required better coordination of supply and demand. So, the whole piece around let's get some trucks, let's get some storage, and let's get this stuff moving wasn't as important as let's just connect the people that want the food with the people that have the food. And so uh, what they've done is set up one of these facilitating food hubs. And so 24 to 30 attendees, uh, all kinds of 
producer, production side, meat, dairy, produce. Um, and also on the other side of the table, food service directors from community kitchen programs, nursing homes, standard retailers, restaurants, schools, colleges, universities. So both of the pieces that a food hub is supposed to put together. So let's just leave out all that stuff in the middle. In fact, as you notice at the bottom, uh, Acorn may follow up three to four months after the event but doesn't get involved in the business matters at all. So the producers and the, and the people who want to buy the produce simply make the contracts the beginning themselves and they get it done. So this is something which looks like you know, a better way to connect demand with supply and not lose money, because it seems like everybody knows how to lose money in this particular business. Um, we do have some, so this is not something which is just in Vermont, it's also in uh, various other places, uh, some in Ann Arbor, uh, this one I think is in California. So no donated, use donated space, uh, there's no infrastructure, there's no additionality program problem because you're basically just trying to get people to talk to each other. And we thought it was something that a local community group with an interest in food could kind of pilot test. So Chinook Food Connect or maybe Lethbridge Sustainable Living could say, well, let's, let's just give, give this a go. You know, and they, and uh, there's lots of good uh, direction uh, on how to do this so it doesn't have to be brought up from zero. Um, okay, before I go to questions and answers, I just want to say that uh, if you want something to read, uh, The Wizard and the Prophet is just a wonderful book, which is just out. Um, and if you don't want to buy the whole book, then there is an article or, you know, in Atlantic Monthly. Looks like this, with an upside down American flag on the cover only imagine who they're talking about there. Uh, but there is in the center of it, so this is a book by Charles Mann, and there's a, about a six-page review of it, and it's called How Will We Feed the New Global Middle Class? So it's a great piece about what do we do with this you know, 10 billion people that are coming our way, and not just the additional people, but the, the 3, million, 3 billion of that are going to have middle class appetite. So that's going to make things even even worse. So it's uh, basically a, a great book to, to read and to think about in terms of the big picture. Uh, the, the Wizards and Prophets kind of are described this way. Wizards see farming as useful drudgery that should be eased and reduced as much as possible to maximize individual liberty. Agriculture is a means to an end, which is efficient food production and distribution. And farm labor is a cost to be minimized through efficient machines and methods. So that sounds like people that you know. And then the prophets see farming as maintaining a set of communities, ecological and human, that cradle and preserve life. Agriculture can be drudgery, but also reinforces the human connection to the earth. And farm labor is good, honest work that builds community. So you probably know whether you're a wizard or a prophet. All right, so questions.